YouTube and welcome to another AB Helicopters video. Today we're going to have a quick look at mountain flying and why it can be so hazardous to pilots. Now unfortunately history is littered with instances of incidents occurring in mountainous areas and the purpose of this video is to shed a small insight into some of the causes and indeed some of the inherent challenges of flying in mountainous terrain. Now, it should be said, whilst there are additional hazards created, uh, it is actually whilst flying this train that some of the most spectacular sights of natural beauty can be had, and it's often where the helicopter can prove its worth, performing missions that are not possible by uh, any other aerial vehicle, or indeed to areas that are inaccessible by the ground. So, for example, mountain rescue, Kazavak, heli skiing, long line operation, or, or aerial uh, work, utility work, avalanche patrol and geographical expeditions and operations, just to, to name a, a couple. Now in this video, uh, we'll give a quick overview of issues such as aircraft performance and limitations, local weather patterns, including uh, wind and fog, physiological effects and ocular illusions that can occur when flying in mountainous terrain, route planning, navigation and escape routes, wires, whiteouts, sloping grounds, and other challenges associated with helicopter uh, landings in mountainous terrain. Now, this video is by no means a comprehensive instructional guide to flying in the mountains, so please do seek formal instructions, uh, instruction before flying in mountainous terrain, and make sure you check the rules and the regulations for the country you're flying in. Europe, for example, um, some countries have restrictions on where you can land off airfield. Now, if the landing site is about 1,500 meters, um, prior reading may save you from a costly fine. So bear in mind. So first off, let's dive into aircraft performance, a major factor in many uh, occurrences. I am, however, afraid to say it's a little bit back to basics in terms of helicopter um, aerodynamics, so bear with us. The lift formula, half rho CL V squared S. Lift is proportional to the density of the air, the uh, coefficient of lift or the angle of attack the airfoil is working at, and then the helicopter, the velocity of the, the blade, so how quickly the, the helicopter plus the, uh, the blade RPM, um, and the surface area of the blade doesn't really change in a helicopter, it's, it's fixed, we don't have any flaps or slats like a fixed wing aircraft. What this means is that as the air density decreases, rho, the lift decreases proportionally. Well, air density decreases uh, as we go up in altitude. Air density is, uh, is a factor of the, the temperature and the, the pressure of the air. Obviously, the, the temperature decreases as you go higher up and the pressure decreases as well. We can usually approximate saying that uh, you, you'll lose two degrees per thousand feet of temperature, two degrees centigrade, and about uh, every um, millibar of pressure will decrease that equates to about 30 feet. As we go higher up in the altitude, the density decreases and the lift produced by an aerofoil, by the rotor blade, in exactly the same conditions as sea level, decreases. So, as we go higher, the aerofoil has to work at a higher pitch angle, or a higher angle of attack, to produce the same lift. This means, however, it may be operating closer to a stalling angle, and secondly, it may be operating at a suboptimal lift to drag ratio. Now this leads to the second side of the story, the engine power available. Many engines, um, the aircraft performance will commonly decrease without it, unless of course the engine is flat rated or supercharged or turbocharged. Um, by the same reason that the lift formula decreases, the density of the air is decreasing. So, not only do you need more uh, power to fly potentially if you're operating at high angle of attack, but the power that you have available may well be less from the engine. This can be seen on performance charts. So that is why a helicopter at maximum gross weight uh, can, can hover out of ground effect at sea level, but actually come five, six, seven thousand feet, it may not be able to hover outside of ground effect. And that's because the air density has decreased. Let's look at a practical example of altitude and the effect of performance on an R44 Raven 2 helicopter. 
Now, the aircraft is certified to 14,000 feet density altitude, i.e. corrected for temperature and pressure differences against the international standard atmosphere. The maximum all-up weight of the Raven 2 R44 is 2,500 pounds, and according to the performance section of the POH Section 5, at this weight, uh, a hover can be achieved under standard conditions up to 7,500 feet in ground effect and 4,500 feet out of ground effect. At this height, due to the reasons discussed previously, the performance degrades and the helicopter cannot maintain its height. Thus, the weight of the helicopter has to thereby be reduced instead, either by reducing the fuel on board or indeed the number of passengers or equipment. If you want to hover out of ground effect at 7,500 feet, for example, you'd have to reduce the weight on board by around 200 pounds, or in practical terms, remove an adult male passenger or drop the fuel carried by the helicopter by 33 US gallons. That's about 71% of the total fuel capacity of the helicopter that's been removed, so not entirely practical. Let's use another example. Say we're flying a uh, relatively light R44 helicopter with two persons on board and a full tank of fuel. That's around 2,200 pounds uh, of, for our takeoff weight. We can happily hover at sea level in and out of ground effect. In the hover at sea level, we, we take note of what power we're using and it's about 21 inches on the manifold air pressure gauge. Looking at the map limit chart, uh, at sea level, 10 degrees, we can continuously use around 22.6 uh, and maximum power up to 25.4 inches. So we're well within power margins. Now we'll take the same helicopter up to 6,000 feet. Again, still within uh, the performance for in and out of ground effect hover. However, the map chart states that our power limit at 6,000 feet with an outside air temperature of three degrees, our power limits now are 20.6 inches and 23.6 inches for maximum takeoff power. In practical terms, at sea level, we had a power margin of over four inches on the manifold air pressure gauge. Plenty of power to do a towering or vertical climb takeoff. However, at 6,000 feet, we only have two and a half inches of power in reserve. Our power margin has been decreased. And whilst we can still hover out of ground effect, if we were to perform that same vertical takeoff and climb, our maximum rate of climb would be seriously reduced from that that we saw at sea level. Now let's take this one step further to 10,000 feet. Now we're much closer to the in-ground effect hover ceiling and we would not be able to hover out of ground effect unless we lost another 100 pounds of weight on board. Our power limit is further reduced to 19.6 inches continuous and 22.4 inches for maximum takeoff. This means only with that five minute takeoff power can we even hover and a vertical climb takeoff would not be advisable as the, the helicopter lacks the power to be able to hover out of ground effect. A prime example of this was back in 2008 when an R44 Raven helicopter was taking off from Korshvar Altiport at the end of a mountain training course. Due to the location of the airfield, there's only one runway direction for takeoff and landing. This meant the helicopter was taking off downwind. Now, despite the aircraft only having three persons on board and thus within uh, the max takeoff weight, and it had the performance for a hover in ground effect, IGE. Um, due to the altitude and the temperature, it didn't have performance for an out of ground effect hover. And whilst transitioning to forward flight, it failed to maintain uh, its altitude and it ended up on its side. Um, fortunately, in this instance, all three occupants escaped relatively unharmed. We'll leave a link to the uh, investigation in the description below. There's also another video um, taken from inside the cockpit of an R66, again links below, that uh, seems to indicate what happens when an aircraft is flown to the edge of its performance ceiling. The engine power is reduced and unable to match the demands of the pilot. As the pilot raises the collective further, the rotor RPM drops, as evident by the low RPM horn that we can hear in the video. Going back to the lift formula that we talked about before, as the velocity of the blades or as the blade RPM decreases, the lift will decrease as well because lift is a function of velocity squared. So even though the pitch angle, uh, as he raises the collective, uh, increases, the angle of attack increases, and the lift coefficient increases, there's a greater decrease in lift 
from the velocity reduction as the blades spin slower and the net impact of over pitching you know, even though he's raising the collective the aircraft will sink further now fortunately uh, as before the occupants escape after having a, a hard landing uh, in the snow um, however the helicopter shortly catches fire after the landing now this brings about another point uh, and it highlights an important factor survival gear when flying in mountains and appropriate clothing uh, you may have to spend the night on a mountainside uh, if weather deteriorates and you have to make a precautionary landing or indeed you know if the worst occurs so make sure you have some provisions water food warm clothing to hand uh, and some way of contacting base be it a, a sat phone an elt uh, because you may not be able to rely on phone signal in remote areas. That's the end of part one of this video. Stay tuned for the second section where we cover the outstanding topics. On the screen, you'll see that we've listed a number of links for content that we think is very valuable and informative. And they're from the New Zealand CAA, from the EHES safety team, and also from the team at Glacier Landings in Switzerland who have put together a really good guide on the technique of landing on various different mountain tops. See you for section two.